I really feel like as we begin this particular portion of our sermon series, I really feel like that what I need, I, I need to make this statement right up front, that I realize that it is because of the privilege that I have as a white person in the world that I'm standing here and I'm gonna talk about race. Now there are some folks who would think that perhaps maybe I shouldn't talk about race because I am a white person. And that's part of where we stand as the Christian people of this world. We stand between that, those lines of who can speak and who cannot. <clears throat> so today when I pray that you only hear God's voice here today, I pray that deeply that that is who we're going to hear today, the Lord talking to us. And I claim and I own that I have white privilege in this world. I claim and I own that I have never ever had to worry about going anywhere because of the color of my skin. Anywhere, nowhere have I been excluded because of the color of my skin. So let's just put that out on the table right now. That most of us here today also have never had to worry about that never had to think about where we were going or who we were talking to because the color of our skin goes along with our Caucasian roots. Let's just all own that and that might help us be in that space today where we begin to look at the box of race that is around us. I read uh, a book for this particular sermon which has completely blown my mind. It's a book by the man uh, Jamar Tisby, and he wrote a book about how the church in the world, the Christian church in the world, especially those that came with our colonization in the United, what becomes the United States of America, have set the tone for race relations in the United States of America. From the 1600s forward, the church, you see, has been complicit in excluding those folks of color, those folks who are different from the time it touched the shores of this country. And I was physically ill reading Mr. Tisby's book because it reminded me that because of the color of my skin, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to think about what the church has done. I can just say, that's okay, Let's leave it back there in the past. It reminded me and it convicted me, it indicted me that because of the color of my skin, I have the privilege to not think about how our country and our church, the Christian church, has hurt other people. I don't think about that on a regular basis, but let me tell you something. I've been thinking about that for four days now. Once I heard the perspective of a different person, a person who doesn't have the privileges that I do because of the color of their skin, I began to look through a different lens. And I began to think about how embedded in our structures as this country is race and racial tension and race relations. And really what I have found out is that this box of race does not just mean people of color. It means any ethnicity in this world that we don't want to include, any ethnicity that we don't like, any ethnicity that we think is less than we are. And so I thought that perhaps maybe that if we want to truly begin to see where we're in the box of race, what we need to do is we need to look at the messages that we have heard from the beginning of this country. Because what I have discovered and what makes me ill, physically ill, is that our country has been racially motivated to oppression since it began. It has been motivated to oppress based upon race and ethnicity since it began. 
And what I want for all of us to remember is this. I don't want you to sit here and feel like you're a bad person because you've been born white Caucasian. I don't want you to feel bad about that because white Caucasian is a part of God. But what I want us to do is to own the fact that we have, as white people, always had more power in this country than any other ethnicity in this world. And if we begin there, then perhaps maybe we begin to realize where we need to erase the lines of our own boxes or erase the lines of the boxes that we've placed people in. <clears throat> so what I decided to do was help us today look at the way these questions have been inbred into our society. This idea of the other has been inbred into our society. And I brought some cartoons and some, and some things um, from our history. Starting back in the 1800s, I went into my computer. And as I sat and went into my computer, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what if, what if the government were to get into my computer someday and see me looking all this stuff up? I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Um, but I, I found some things. And I have to tell you, as I found these things, I brought you the nicest of what I found. Okay, advertisements against different groups, different ethnicities in our world. I brought these to show you if there, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to offend anybody. But what I do want us to do is I want us to see what our world, our society has been like for a very, very long time. I want you to hear the messages that we think perhaps maybe we're just hearing in the 21st century, they have been heard in every century of our society. Steve, can you start with the first one? This one, if you can see it, is from May 24th, 1882 in a magazine called Puck, which was a satirical magazine, okay? On this side, it says, you see all these people who look like they're doing something? It says, United States working for it. Uh, uh, Bernie, would you shut that one, those off, maybe that might help too. These over here, the, the spotlights. Um, United States working for it. On this side, Ireland waiting for it. In 1882, the Irish were the despised in this country. And how they propagated this propaganda against the Irish was to say that they were lazy that they wanted everything that we have, that they wanted to take from us all of our stuff. Does that sound familiar to anybody? They are coming to take our stuff. They are coming to destroy our way of life. Sound familiar? Steve, would you show the next one? So this one is from the late 1800s also. This is about the Italian immigrants to the United States of America. You may not be able to see, but this, they're rats. They're depicted as rats. The Italians were depicted as rats with human faces on them. They were depicted as rats because when the Italians came in to New York and, and places like that, they were sent off to live in places where there was no running water. There was no good sanitation. And so, of course, they couldn't wash themselves or they couldn't wash their clothing. And so they began to smell. And then people began to call them rats. And as you can see in this picture, Uncle Sam is standing there ready to swat them down with his staff. One of the rats has a headband on that says, anarchists. Those Italians are coming here to take what we've got. And the other one says, mafia. They are coming here to rule us. Do you see the subtle messages of racism and ethnocentric that we are talking about right here? And you can't really read it up here, but on that little box that looks like the lid has been lifted up, it says, dumping into our society every day. The Italians were seen as rats. We called them rats. And most of the Italians look like us. Not like me, because I'm really white, but most of the Italians <laughs> look like most of us sitting here. Steve, can I see the next one? <clears throat> this is from California, a place where we think is really liberal, right? 
Everybody's welcome in California, not in the late 1800s, because the regular working man's ticket, and I found several of these, the regular working man's party were trying to expel all of the Chinese workers that had come into California. The Chinese must go. Guess what was said about the Chinese? They're going to take all of our jobs. They're going to work for so much less, we won't have the opportunity to get a good paying job. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Next one, Steve. <clears throat> this one. This one is from World War II in the United States of America. This one is, this is a Jewish emergency, not an American emergency. It's their fault that they're in the concentration camps. It's not our fault that they're there. Jewish conniving room, Washington, D.C. And you see that they have the depiction of FDR there, as if FDR were Jewish. And they're ta he's talking about how the Jews are coming to take what we can. And then at the bottom it says, the Jews, the people of Jesus, the Jews, are the cause of high taxes, slavery, starvation, and death. Break the Jew control before our country is totally destroyed. Sound familiar? Sound like things that we still hear in our society today? Next one, Steve. <clears throat> this one, some of you may remember. This is from World War II also. It's about the Japanese. Let's kill the Japs because we're going to conserve the materials we have. They're coming to take it away from us. We've got to get rid of them. Now, I understand that a lot of this is wartime propaganda, but it was so bad that thousands of Japanese in the United States of America were put in concentration camps. We like to call them internment camps because that's a softer understanding. Thousands of Japanese people in the United States of America were put in concentration camps. Next one, Steve. Virginia state law requires all colored passengers to ride in the rear of the bus. Here's where we think race divides itself. We have the privilege as white people to think that race is all about black and white. It's not. It's not. But this is such a part of our history as this society that we have to question it. We have to be willing to look at it. We have to be asking ourselves, are we still a part of it? Next one, Steve. This one I love. It's an advertisement to join the KKK. When I say KKK, what do you think of? You think of the old, solid, democratic South, right? And now you think of the new, Republican, solid South, correct? All those KKK, all those white sheet wearing people, they were in the South. Not true. This is an advertisement for Shelton, Connecticut. We believe in our minds, because we have the privilege to believe it, that anything above the Mason-Dixon line was okay. Anything below the Mason-Dixon line was bad. This is an advertisement for the KKK in the 1950s for the state of Connecticut. Really high up above the Mason-Dixon line. Next one. We serve whites only, no Spanish or Mexicans. No Spanish or Mexicans. Next one. This one is really current. This is from this century. I hate Mexicans. You see, when we talk about race, when we talk about that box right here that says, race, where people have been stuffed because of their ethnicity and their color, we have to realize that we have heard these messages all of our lives. There's never not been a time in our history as a society when we have not heard the messages, they are after us. They are coming to get us. They want what we have. They're going to take our jobs. They are lazy. The Irish particularly, and I've got Irish blood, the Irish were particularly seen as lazy people. We still hear those messages today. 
And yet, our scriptures that we heard today make it very clear that God isn't interested in race. That there is no dividing line for God about race. Because the scripture made it very clear today that Jesus went to that other, an ethnicity, the Roman, when the Roman needed him. And the Acts of the Apostles make it very clear that God created all nations in our midst. That everyone comes from God. So that means when we look at the person that we want to place in that box of race, we need to see God in that person. That should be mind-blowing to some people that perhaps God is white and black and Italian and Irish and Scottish and Japanese and Chinese and Korean and, and any other that we want to create. It should be mind-blowing to us that God is everyone in our midst. And yet, we've not learned that, have we? We have not learned that our job as Christian people are to cross those boundaries of hate, get out of that box of hate that we can put ourselves in and, and um, insulate ourselves with. We are to get out of that and do as Jesus did. If a person hurts, we help. If a person needs us, we help. If a person calls upon us for aid, we help like Jesus helped the Roman centurion healing his servant. But that's not really what we see on a regular basis. What we see on a regular basis is that box growing and growing and growing and exponentially. They need to be over there. They need to be over there. They need to be behind that wall. They need to be behind that wall. They need to be gone. They need to be out of here because they are coming for us. You see, all of this is motivated by fear. Fear that what we have, that power that we have, that privilege that we have, is going to be taken away from us. You know, I can't remember the exact amount of times, but do you know that the thing that's said over and over and over again in the Bible is do not be afraid? And yet we are afraid as a people. We are afraid that someone not like us is coming to take it all away from us. And then what will we do? I looked up some statistics because I like statistics. The best I could get was um, 2017. In 2017, the FBI reported that there were 7,100 hate crimes in the United States of America. Hate crimes are usually those ones that are designated that have been caused because someone has done something specifically to a different race or a different ethnicity or something like that. That is a 17% increase from 2016 to 2017. From 2016 to 2017, hate crimes in the United States of America against those who are different ethnicities or different races than we are grew 17%. But here's the startling statistic. 23% of all hate crimes are religiously motivated. 23% of all hate crimes in the United States of America as recorded in 2017 were religiously motivated that means, I'm Christian, you're not, I'm going to harm you. I'm this, you're not, I'm going to harm you. Hold on. In 2017, 37% of the hate crimes in the United States of America were anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish crimes. Think back to the mid-century, mid-20th century, where that piece of advertisement said, the Jews are coming to destroy our country. They're coming to harm us. 
You see how we are still living in that mindset, whether we realize it or not? And while we might not be active participants in that sort of crime in this world, the Center for Equality, the Equality Institute in the world, says the basis of how white supremacy or white crime against other ethnicities gets started in this world is indifference. Indifference is what starts all this off. We turn our heads the other way when we see all of that going on. We convince ourselves that because it's not happening to us, we don't need to pay any attention to it. The next level is minimization. I'm, you know, I can go up all of these levels, but those two really come home to us. We may not be actively committing the crimes, but we are either indifferent to the crimes that are happening, we're not paying attention to them, or we minimize them. Oh, it wasn't so bad. Oh, you know, the, um, the, the synagogue got bombed, but nobody was hurt. Minimization is helping us to not pay attention to what's really going on with all of God's children in this world. Perhaps, maybe, some of us in our minds are like that guy in New Zealand who said the other day that the Muslims brought it on themselves that they were murdered because they came into a place where they shouldn't be. They came here and we didn't want them. And so they really brought it on themselves. If they had just stayed where they were supposed to stay, they would still be alive. I know that's a shocking thing to hear and that many of us here, I trust that many of us here would never say those things out in this world. But what many of us might also do in our world is not talk about what that man said. We would be indifferent to it because what we don't want to do is offend anybody. We don't want to make people upset we don't want people to dislike us because we ask people about the ways they're participating in the system of oppression against the races and the ethnicities in the world. You notice I said, I don't want to offend you with these cartoons. I'm a part of the problem. I'm a part of the problem because I want people to like me. I don't want them to think that I dislike them. So what I do is, is that I don't sometimes talk as prophetically as I know God has called me to speak. I think this box, this box of race in our lives, is the hardest box that we have to carry around. It's the box that none of us want to talk about, that none of us want to find ourselves in, that none of us are willing to try and jump out of or stomp on and break down. But if we are the people of Christ, don't we have to? Don't we have to talk about how we're not following Jesus, the one who went to whomever needed help, regardless of who they were? Isn't that part of what we do on our spiritual growth journeys? to look at those places that are hard for us to look at and walk right into them and start changing. You see, transformation doesn't occur through happiness and joy, joy, joy. Happy, all the transformation that has occurred in our lives comes because we are faced with a hard situation that we have to walk ourselves through and we change. Maybe, maybe we can just change by picking up a book and starting to read about how other people of other ethnicities, other races feel in our country. Maybe we can just get over the fact that we don't want to talk about this because it makes us feel bad. Maybe we can just take one step and we'll be closer to living our lives the way that Christ has modeled for us to live, opening the doors. Amen. We come